into this uh, second session of our first ever tortoise slates, not tortoise lattes, which would have been an entirely different concept. But um, I'm, as uh, Mark said, I'm Matt Dancona, I'm an editor at Tortoise. And um, believe it or not, in a, in a former life, before I was Mark's personal assistant, um, <laughs> centuries ago, I was a professional historian myself, briefly. Um, which is not to say that professional history lost anything by my departure. Uh, quite the opposite, I think, actually. Um, and I, um, I think that the, the general field gained in, in Collective IQ by my departure. But I still retain an absolute fascination with it. And I'm, as a consequence, really thrilled to be hosting this session um, on Nostalgia and Lies. Um, and particularly thrilled to welcome two fantastic speakers, both of whom have recently published excellent books on this particular theme um, related to it. Hannah Rosewoods, who taught history at Cambridge um, and is the author of Rural Nostalgia, A Backwards History of Britain, uh, and is also a frequent broadcaster, and Otto English, that is his Jim Predo-style work name. <laughs> his, <laughs> we shall refer to him as Andrew the evening, because we are amongst friends. Andrew Scott. Uh, he's a prolific commentator, uh, polemicist, and uh, doughty Twitter warrior, and not least in the service of the fighting Brexit. Um, and recent, more recently, author of a very uh, interesting book, Fake History, Ten Great Lies and How They Shape the World. So, um, because time is short, I want to just dive really straight in and, and, and turn to you, Hannah, and you know, ask, in the book, you... you make this wonderful observation that if you, and I'm quoting, trace nostalgia back to its source, you simply find more nostalgia. And I, I had to jot that down. <laughs> can you, can you uh, unpack it and elaborate upon it? Yeah, um, so the structure of my book is backwards. Um, it begins in the present, kind of amid our current culture wars about history and a very kind of nostalgic, heroic, kind of glorious, romantic vision of British history that's, you know, been disputed by historians and defended by politicians. Um, but I wanted to kind of work my way back step by step and think, well, if we are, for example, nostalgic for the Blitz spirit today or what we imagine the Blitz spirit to have been, you know, what were people during the Blitz nostalgic for? Um, so I wanted to kind of trace my way step by step um, until we got to the Reformation in the 16th century. Um, and obviously, you know, no one, you know, when I, when I got to the previous generation, at no point did anyone say, ah, oh, yes, we are the good old days. Um, you finally arrived. Yeah. It's sort of like the Indiana Jones film, where Indiana Jones and the good old days <laughs> finally gets there and then angrily walks across a bridge to get it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, I, d I didn't want to make the argument about whether kind of people in Britain now are uniquely nostalgic or kind of pathologically nostalgic or, you know, whether people in Britain are more nostalgic than people in other countries. You know, I think it's absolutely, you know, it's a universal, it's part of the human condition. What I did want to do is take the current debates about nostalgia that we're having and use that as a way of telling quite a different story about British history and to ask how our image of British history changes when we start to put the nostalgias of, of people that lived through those times front and centre. I mean, it is interesting, I mean, you alluded to it there, that to, to, to put it mildly, there is a roaring trade in nostalgia and not just in this country and not always with benign effects. Yeah. And the notion of recovering something, retrieving something, being stopped from doing so by various uh, identified foes yeah. is very powerful on our politics now. And, and, you know, take back control is very important in Brexit, but it has corollaries in Make America Great Again, MAGA. And in Italy, you know, you listen to what Giorgio Maloney is saying, and it is a very, very uh, gamey, toxic... Um, yeah. I mean, to call it nostalgia almost doesn't do justice to the full kind of strength of it. So why, why is it now such a powerful and divisive force? I mean, I think it always has the potential to be a powerful and divisive force. It, you know, it's history often feels very personal for us. You know, we're, like, we're all nostalgic, you know, for things in our own lives. You know, we feel grief for people that we've lost. 
you know, it, it's very easy for someone to come along and to say, take those feelings that you feel. And th those feelings are important. I'm not saying that we should, you know, try and do away with them. But it's, you know, it's very easy for someone to come along and say, ah, those feelings are about the national past. And, and something that's not something that you've lost by the passage of time, that that's something that's been taken away from you by, you know, whatever group of the yeah. day that is being blamed. Um, but yeah, I mean, I feel, you know, it kind of, it, it's particularly fertile ground whenever we feel that change is spiralling out of control, whenever we feel that, you know, things might be declining in some ways. I think that the time is ripe for is it the, Is it the sheer speed of modern life and the sense that we're constantly shifting and moving, if not in geographically, then in terms of our identities and, and what we're being bombarded with online. I mean, it, it is part of the reason that nostalgia is so easy to weaponize now, that there are very specific conditions at the moment. Well, I wouldn't say at the moment. I, I mean, I would say at the moment, but not specifically and exclusively be, yeah. at this moment. You know, I, I think, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, it both is and isn't. Um, you know, I think it's always been part of what it means to be modern. And, you know, we could trace that back to when nostalgia was first invented as a term in the 17th century. You know, Tell us about that, because it's an interesting story in the book. Yeah, so w when nostalgia was first coined as a term, it was a deadly disease. Um, it was coined by a Swiss physician in 1688 called Johannes Hofer, um, and he wanted to find a term for this mysterious new disease that seemed to be affecting soldiers fighting abroad. They, they seemed to be kind of sick with longing. They were hearing the voices of loved ones that weren't there. They were kind of wasting away, and, and he felt the only cure was to return and be reconnected with their homelands. So he coined the term by um, kind of mashing together the Greek word nostos, meaning homecoming, with the suffix alga, meaning pain. Um, but yeah, over time, you know, the meaning of nostalgia broadened from this potentially fatal disease to a milder and much more common condition. And it began to encompass, as it did so, the longing for a faraway time as well as place. Um, and yeah, you know, it's, it was just really co-opted into what it meant to be a modern individual living in a world of change where, you know, many things were changing for the better. You know, much of it was progress, but people were increasingly looking back and reflecting on what had been lost as well as gained. Um, you know, Do you see it as a pejorative word or a value neutral word? In the sense, I mean, can nostalgia be benign or even useful? I mean, it's never entirely shed its kind of pathological associations, yeah. had it? We, you know, I think we think of it as a bit of a, a guilty pleasure, something a bit kind of saccharine and cosy and twee sometimes. Um, but yeah, I, sociologists and psychologists kind of have studied it quite extensively and, and they emphasise what, you know, a really positive emotion it is for us, that it's really great for our mental health, um, that when we you know, look back on Italy in pubs complaining that things are <laughs> they used to be kind like of. this. It's good for your mental health. Okay. Yeah, I mean, if you if you look back and you anchor yourself in a story of who you are and where you've come from, that connects you to others, um, you know, it kind of it really boosts your mood, um, right. and it kind of gives the feeling paradoxically of a stable base from which you feel more ready to jump out and face the unknown. So you can have the nos without the alga. If, I suppose is that the it answer? Can be, it can be bittersweet with a kind of emphasis yeah, yeah, on the yeah. sweet. Yeah, yeah. Andrew, um, you've, you've you've really in the book, um, you, you know, you've really gone for it, which is to, to itemise a series of a series of lies, <laughs> a series of lies. Yeah. Um, give us a couple of examples of fake history, just to sort of whet our appetite. <clears throat> well. Uh, Dunkirk is my favourite bit of fake history. Harry Styles. That Harry Styles <laughs> singing uh, on the beaches of, yes. of northern France. Um, I think we all remember that. Uh, no, uh, God bless him. God bless him and yeah. whatever. Uh, no, um, Dunkirk is my favourite. I've been, you know, when you write a book, you go on sort of, you get invited to events, lovely events like this, and you sort of go around the country hoping no one's going to lynch you at some point. And uh, I, I, one of the stories that I have told on that journey around the country is the one of Dunkirk, which is that most people in their minds think of Dunkirk as being this heroic evacuation from France, um, you know, the British Expeditionary Force fleeing, and then that um, turn on, on the moment of a coy moment where, when uh, it looked like all would be lost and... 
uh, they look up and they see the little ships coming over the horizon. It's in the in the recent film. There is an, that scene is portrayed exactly like that, and um, I think you know, if we go to the Imperial War Museum, there's the Tamazine, which is one of the rowing boats which uh, was taken. And in my childhood, my father, who was actually um, well, I'm turning into Charles Brandreth. <laughs> <laughs> In we're my all, childhood, we're all turning into Giles Brandreth. It's just a sequel, question of time. It must have something in it. It's um, a progressive illness. My father, my, my father was born in 19... No, my, my father was an old soldier. My father would take me to the Imperial War Museum and walk me around and he'd say, and that was one of the boats that they used for the evacuation from Dunkirk. And later on, I had children of my own and my son and I were in the, the Imperial War Museum maybe a decade ago. He's just turned 18. And I said, and that's one of the boats that um, they used to evacuate from Dunkirk. Except uh, that isn't what happened. <laughs> That's not what happened. Uh, we all think of people, fishermen and sort of local pleasure boaters, rallying together <coughs> to get their craft out and to go out there and to, to bring the boys home. Uh, and that, that isn't the case. Uh, the boats were largely requisitioned by the uh, Coast Guard and the Royal Navy and they were taken across the English Channel specifically to be used to take people from um, shore to ship. Uh, and many of the boats and, and ships were then abandoned, uh, which left me, leaves me wondering in the book why somebody brought the Tamazine home. But that's another story that you'll have to read. It's a rather peculiar story, that. But anyway... Um, when I tell that story out uh, at festivals and things, sometimes I see some people, often elderly people, on the front row, visibly recoil. Visibly recoil. On their well, and, and on two occasions, I've heard one, one uh, clearly a couple, the wife or the husband, turn to the other person, did you know that? Because that myth is so entrenched in our collective nostalgia for the Second World War, the idea that sort of Britain, held together by bits of string and sticky back plastic, managed to get people across the English Channel and to regroup and go back and save the day. It, it's critical to how we view the war and perhaps how many people in this country view themselves. And uh, that, I think, is a very good example of what I call fake history. Yeah, I imagine I, there have been a fair few references to Dunkirk in number 10 in the last few days. <laughs> had, a wild, had a wild guess. Um, but um, just go back to the, the title of the book, Fake History, which is obviously, you know, invites uh, yeah. a comparison with, with the, the word fake news and, and the, the modernity of that. And I wanted to ask you about the proliferation of historical falsehood, because obviously historical falsehood is not new by any means. But um, is it a question of supply or demand or both? I mean, we, we, we look at the digital revolution and, you know, when, when broadband became commonplace, one of the assumptions was that this would lead to a flourishing of um, correction, fact-checking and knowledge because people would go, ah, you know, I wonder what Dunkirk, I'll go and check up on that, you know? Whereas, in fact, what it led to, and, you know, some of the results are horrific, was that at one point... Um, that this has changed, but when you went into Google um, and you tapped in Holocaust, the first 10 sites you got were Holocaust denial sites. Mm -hmm. So the gate, one of the problems of um, the new e information ecosphere is that the gatekeepers that we used to grow up with, uh, are, are they still there, exist, but their power has been massively um, reduced. Now, is that... Is it supply, is it demand? What, what's going on here? And you help us. It's a really massive question, that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think, uh, I mean, the easy answer is all of the above. Yeah. <laughs> but but I'll, I'll give you a proper answer, which is, yes, the internet is a massive revolution in terms of providing information to people. And yes, the answers are out there, but also a lot of the wrong, well-intentioned wrong answers are out there. You know, Wikipedia and things are good for a quick reference point for some people, but it's, it, it is peppered with misinformation and, and wrong dates and wrong facts and things like that. So that's the go-to for a lot of people. If they're trying to 
you know, if you're quickly trying, if someone's quickly trying to check a bit of history, they might go to, say, Wikipedia or some online encyclopedia, but those too might have mistakes in them. I think the odd small error probably doesn't matter so much. Um, my personal obsession is completely fake quotes that uh, yeah. proliferate on JPEGs. And, and there are a lot of them. And there are a lot of them. You mentioned them. You list some of them. With, and they're fascinating. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, two pages of my book. I'll tell you, I mean, you know, we all grew up, I mean, many of us grew up, with the stories of, of Winston Churchill being a sort of brilliant stand-up comedian with fantastic timing. You know, he, he meets um, Bessie Braddock in the House of Commons and she says, you're drunk, Winston. He says, and you're ugly, but in the morning I'll be sober. <laughs> right? Great story. It's actually from a 19th century vaudeville act. Yeah? <laughs> uh, a man called Boris Johnson, who you might have heard of, in his book on Winston Churchill, claims he identified the very spot where that interaction took place, suggesting breaking news that he might be a liar. <laughs> this is a radical... It's a radical... And possibly kind of, yeah, legally kind of... dangerous observation <laughs> <laughs> uh, for such a, 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 a storied statesman. Um, and it's... <laughs> I mean, if you can't trust Boris Johnson, who can you trust? Well, exactly, yeah. 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 Um, he throws a hell of a party. Um, yeah. But... It's funny, it's funny you should mention him, yeah. because his book on Churchill was, I think until Andrew Roberts's book on Churchill appeared, the single best-selling yeah. uh, single-volume book on Churchill by, by a long way. You know, poor old Martin Gilbert, you have to mm -hmm. think. Um, and that says nothing good about him, because it is a terrible book. But it also doesn't say a great deal about us, does it? Because it is just a book of flung together, anecdotage, you know, half verified stories, a very, very easy to spot subplot about how it would be great to have someone else a bit like mm. Churchill as Prime Minister, <laughs> you know, if you had... I wonder who he meant. Uh, he was very hard yeah, to work out. Yeah. But, I mean, actually, I mean, the, 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 part, the, 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 the success of that book, I thought, was was really culturally significant because it was tosh but it was very very popular and successful tosh now what so what nerve did that strike well that too uh, that trick has been played before because kennedy for, is, a, is a very profiles good example uh, profiles of courage yeah. a book he really didn't write uh, yeah, himself, yeah. but we'll cut that. So that's a story for another day. Um, Kennedy too hammered home the parallels between look at these great men, uh, you know, with all the subtlety of a pneumatic drill. You know, <laughs> uh, and Churchill did the same. So yes, people throughout history have appropriated uh, other figures and then latched onto them. I'm sure Hannah's got plenty of examples. <laughs> well, I, I was going to ask you. And I mean, because we were sort of really now in, in, into the weeds of culture wars. And is it possible to pull history out of that morass? And actually, or more radically, is it necessary? I mean, is the dialectic that is happening now, which is there is a, there are, you know, professional historians like yourselves, but there are also, you know, people who are fighting to defend uh, specific views of history. Um, is that just, is that actually how history is made, that sort of dialectical constant clash? Yeah, it's an interesting question and I, I don't know if I've got a straightforward answer to it, but I, I, obviously I would as a historian say that it is important that we get history right and that we kind of reclaim that from the culture wars. Um, I mean, I, th I think a problem historically has been that historians haven't been great at communicating to people what it is that they do. Um, you know, I think my grandparents are still surprised when, you know, when, when I told them what my book was about. They're like, oh, it's not, it's not really history, is it? You know, that, that's, that's more like emotions. Um, you know, they just, you know, have that absolute kind of straight down the line, kings, queens, battles, wars, you know, notable, you know, famous faces, notable names, kind of great man history. Um, and, you know, historically, kind of academic historians have been quite happy to just you know, sit back and kind of deride popular history and leave it to people like Boris Johnson. Um, and I think that has changed recently. Um, you know, I think, 
you know, definitely like TV commissioners and radio commissioners are much more likely now to kind of look to professional historians yeah. for expertise. There's a lot of great history yeah. out there. Um, I think, yeah, the kind of the lines between academic and popular history are really blurring. Um, you know, f I think really for the better. But the, the problem is at the exact same time that that's happened, half the cabinet and the prime minister have, you know, addressed the national media saying, you know, these historians and heritage workers who are doing this, they're doing Britain down. Mm. They're waging this shamefully unpatriotic campaign to make you feel bad about yourself. And we have to put a stop to that. I mean, what um, worries me about that, I suppose, is not just that I think they, they have to be wrong on the whole, but it implies that history has a sort of um, it has a, a, a responsibility beyond the search for the truth. Yeah. And, I, and, and I, I'm very interested in what both of you have, to, have, to have thoughts on, whether history has a purpose beyond the excavation of the truth. Because some people actually, if you push them, will say, well, actually it does. You know, its job is to inform our decision making today, or its job is to uh, rescue the disenfranchised of the past, or its job is to, contrarily, you know, buttress yeah. um, a national myth. Yeah. Um, and I wonder whether, it, you know, the real fight is to protect its integrity as an academic discipline. I'd, be, I'd love to hear what both of you have to say on that. Yeah, I mean, what, genuinely what I would say is the first and most important thing is that, you know, that's a debate that, you know, absolutely let us have that. But what history is literally doing at the moment is acting as a gatekeeper for who can access British citizenship. Mm. You know, there is like a compulsory history component in the UK citizenship test that is this very kind of, you know, great and glorious kind of our island story, heroic deeds mm. version of history, which, you know, hundreds of professional historians have signed, um, you know, kind of petition say to the government, you know, this is just manifestly wrong in parts. Um, you know, it's, it's misleading, definitely, but, you know, just factually wrong in certain points. You know, they kind of assert as fact that there were never slaves, people ne were never held as slaves in Britain. Um, you know, just as one example complete of just falsehood. complete falsehood. Um, and actually, they've now acknowledged there's a kind of little preamble now in the uh, the Life in the UK test book wait, that you get to revise where they say, you know, it's been brought to our attention that not everything is completely accurate <laughs> in here. Don't um, worry. If in doubt, <laughs> yeah. use the official answer. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That wouldn't really work so, in driving tests, would it? No. You know? <laughs> Some of these might be wrong in the theory test, but don't worry, you know, you'll, you'll figure it out on the road. You know, I do absolutely, to kind of bring it back to, to what you asked, I do absolutely think we have a moral responsibility to tell the truth, and it's important. But, you know, that's having very real effects yeah. in the present. Yeah. It, you well, know, it's not just a kind of question of how we feel No, no indeed, indeed. Yeah. Uh, and what about you, Andrew? What, do you think history has a sort of cap P purpose? Yes, it was. Abba so famously pointed out the history book on the shelf is always repeating itself. Yeah. And, and it gets back to the primary te yeah, text, doesn't it? And they always go back to those those core texts, yeah. Um, <laughs> so yes, it does have a it does have that purpose to one, I think. I mean I am not a historian. You know, I've written a history book, but I am not my background is not I am not an academic. Uh, so, which is one reason why I play so fast and loose with things in that book in a way that I think an academic historian probably would stare aghast and in horror at. But um, that, that's the thing that drove me to wrote, write the book, actually. Because um, growing up, as I, as, as I started off the book with the story of growing up, I was surrounded by uh, a complete contradiction between what I was growing up believing, the toys I was playing with, the movies I was watching on the television, and the lived experiences of my father and my grandfather. My grandfather had fought in the First World War, my father had fought in the Second. Uh, and I was forever, uh, you know, suffering some sort of cognitive dissonance because I couldn't rationalise the two things. And so I would go back to that thing that I was saying about Dunkirk. We have to understand what really happened. And I think we have to really understand what happened in our recent past, because so much, like Brexit, is the most obvious example, but also Trump and people and the MAGA movement, so much is informed by a completely warped telling, mistelling, of recent history. And what Hannah's alluding to, uh, these groups who we shall not mention, uh, 
like History Reclaimed, for example, uh, groups, <laughs> groups like that are, they are sort of engaged in a very peculiar dance because they say that they want a, a proper a proper analysis of what has happened in our past while clearly being engaged in some cultural battle to keep people in the dark and keep people believing the myth over what actually happened. Well, well history reclaimed, of course, is, is a classic example of nostalgia, isn't it? That history used to be brilliant and now it's been taken away and yeah. so it's time to reclaim it. Um, I think of them as like the poppy monster. <laughs> okay, you're going to have to elaborate on that. <laughs> I think we're really getting to have the bone seen, here. There's like a Twitter account called Giant Poppy Watch where yes. they they look for kind of examples of like what is seemingly remembrance but kind of gone out of control. Yeah. So like one of them, for example, was a kind of it was a horrific creation. It was like I think it was like in a supermarket entrance, a kind of humanoid shape, like a life-size humanoid shape composed entirely of poppies. Okay. And you think, well, you know, clearly. <laughs> Uh, remembrance is very important, but is that but what's happening here? You know. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. I think you know. It's not I the think, primary function, is it really? Yeah, and I think we are doing a genuine disservice yeah. to the very people whose memory we're supposed to be honouring. And and it, it seems. I mean, I don't want to linger too long on history reclaimed because. Um, you know they, 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 they don't deserve the they attention, don't deserve the attention yeah. but but they do but they do they do symbolize a a kind of betrayal myth don't they that is now quite powerful in history yeah. Um, and then it seems to me, and seems to me to be, be getting worse, which yeah. is what I'm, I'm really interested in. I mean, do you, I, do you yeah, see that? Yeah, I, and I think for a lot of people, it feels deeply personal because they're trying to reclaim their childhoods, not history. Yes. Um, Paging Dr. Freud. Well, <laughs> a Andrew has this fantastic article um, about the, the ideology of Daniel Hannan yes. being the kind of ladybird. Yes. Lady Bird Version libertarians, of I call it. Yes, yes. yes. But, you know, basically. <laughs> I mean, again, that. if you grew up with Lady Bird books, as I'm sure you and I did, I certainly did. Uh, um, um, did you at all? Uh, we all had these sort of we had these thin tomes that were sort of the standard texts. Uh, and I remember looking into the, at those pictures and thinking, it looked look like a really lovely place, the past. Yes. <laughs> those pastel colours and all the streets yes. were clean. And, you know, even the rats looked quite nice yeah. in, in they the Charles II. They all turned out. They, all, they were well turned out, even the peasants, yes. yes. And, Excellent and they, wi yes, and they also and... knew how it would turn out because there was a sort of inevitable... And that's the same in our island story, the H.G. E. Marshall book. Yes. There's this sort of inevitable sense of an inevitability of history where everything, even the bad stuff, somehow is good because uh, it sort of makes the, the better thing better. How much uh, more exciting it is when yes, the, the, the battering of the peasants thing. stops. Yes. You know, it's, it's kind of a more exciting moment. I mean, on, on that, um, you know, H.G. E. Marshall, I think, is, is a book that very few people... I actually have read it all, and I, I'm still bare the emotional scars. <laughs> but it, but it, 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 you, you talk in, in, in the book, Andrew, about how... Figures not just like Churchill, but they 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 sort of become recruited to fiction. Yeah. You know, they, you say you know Churchill in, in a way now is is as much like Bond or Sherlock Holmes. Well, I also say Dolly Parton. And yeah. indeed, of course, I was <laughs> yeah. going to go on the yeah. obvious comparative <laughs> Dolly, <laughs> Dolly Parton. Yeah. Um, but it, why is that? Why is it that the char characters that uh, what? Why has he become a character rather than a figure? Because I think. We all collectively, as a, as a species, love good stories. Mm. We all like heroes. We all like hero myths. And, um, you know, that's talking backwards history. You go back in time, the same heroes appear again and again and again, just in different formats. You know, Indiana Jones is, is just the latest incarnation of a long line of sort of Heraclean myths of, of the same story being retold and retold. It's called the monomyth, isn't it? It's mm. the, going out on the adventure, slaying the dragon, coming back and having adventures along the way. So we all love stories, we all love hero stories, and we want our heroes to be larger than life. If James Bond was a sort of tax accountant from Weybridge, <laughs> he would not perhaps have had such a long-running franchise. You say Apologies that. Apologise to everybody <laughs> if they are. Are you sure? From Weybridge. Um, but, the, but, but we want these larger-than-life 
people. And, and, so, and I think, to a large extent, it's the same with our history. We want our own history to be larger than life because it's a sort of, you know, almost particularly in this country, sadly, in recent years, because it's not the case. In all, all countries exaggerate and mythologize, but it has been particularly rampant in this country over the last 40 years, really. Uh, th as, as I think we have sought to come to terms with what country we are now, what it's all about, uh, what we do, who we are and where we go. And, and that's really what the culture war stuff is really all about. It's about fighting out identity. I mean, notwithstanding the point, Hannah, that you know, nostalgia has always been with us, it is the case, isn't it, that, that you know, as Britain's power on the, you know, hard power on the global yeah. stage has declined and at the moment appears to be, you know, in danger of going completely. Um, we, we have become that much more reflexively attached, I think, to some aspects of that myth. And again, I, you know, taking, taking account of what you said previously about, you know, there, there always being a yearning for the past, mm -hmm. there is something quite sharp about it now, isn't there? That, that, that we, we are we are told that you know we're told that if we don't agree with this we're miserablists or you know uh ramonas or uh members of the liberal elite or people who read books you know <laughs> uh which is then that is the worst um you don't want to get involved in that but i mean it is it is there is a kind of philistinic reflex there which which i think it, it may not be new but it is specific and intense at the moment that's the problem, isn't it? We're told. You know, how many people would be this passionately attached to, a, for example, like a blameless version of Britain's imperial history, were it not for genuinely the majority of our media outlets and our former prime minister and half the cabinet saying, that is entirely correct and anyone who tells you otherwise is a Britain-hating traitor. Yeah. You know, we used to pride ourselves. It used to be thought to be a quintessentially patriotic British trait to wear your patriotism very lightly and to be a bit embarrassed of like nationalistic displays of flag waving yeah. because, you know, we used to say, what's the kind of thing that Americans do? And they're a bit chippy, aren't they, <laughs> compared yeah. to Britain? You know, that used to be a huge point of pride. And yeah, I, people, you know, a section of people in public life are very loudly telling us that actually we should be feeling a lot more serious or else about our history or else yeah you you've taught at cambridge tell us about your students approach to history and whether you think it is different to that of previous generations <laughs> yeah i mean i think they're more politically engaged when it comes to history they you know it's very clear to them what's at stake uh, given you know how history has been being spoken about in the media um, I don't know, I just, it, it, it was a bit, I mean, I'm not in academia anymore, um, but it was quite a surreal experience really seeing how university students and universities are like portrayed in the media in a way that's completely divorced from reality. In the um, sense that they're not the snowflakes of myth or, or what? I mean, it, well, just the sense that they're all kind of, uh, you know, <laughs> radical Marxist agitators seeking to undermine the freedom of Western civilization yeah. as we know it. You know, I just think... I hate that you know, when that <laughs> I, hate, I hate it when that happens, you know. You know, I just think <laughs> it probably... It ruins the evening. Probably, like, students are exactly as they've always been, left-leaning generally, but, you know, Cambridge is a broad church. Yeah, you know, no, it I certainly just, is. Uh, yeah, it, I, just, I th just think it's very strange and sinister, this kind of... Dual, this kind of dual motion, kind of motion of you know, historians can't be trusted with history, and the people yes. they're teaching can't be you know trusted with it either. This danger to our nation's youth. Yeah. Across twelve pages. Um, we, I mean, it 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 is interesting, Andrew, isn't it? This. I mean, one of the things that both of you have identified is that actually, and I suspect again, digital technology plays a part in this. Is that a very small group of people can a, a achieve a completely disproportionate. Mm -hmm. um, you know, level of influence over debates. Mm. You know, I, did you when you were researching the book? Did you did you find that the the lies you were trying to nail had been, you know, weaponized and turbocharged by by this? Yeah, well, particularly the the ones in, within this country. Yes, I mean the astroturfery, which is 
portraying yourself as a grassroots movement when you're nothing of the sort and you're linked to some think tank or... I mean, the, the, I don't want to use the term web, but I will use the term web. The web of astroturf outfits in this country which are saying, save our statues or do this, they're all interlinked with each other. It's the right, same... Okay. They've got the same poster address. The, they've got the same poster address. Tuffin Street. They've got the same people. <laughs> they've got the same personnel. If you go on to the... Uh, I, you know, I, I have a lot to do in my life, but I do <laughs> take an hour or two each well, day just to click on to the really. links. To it's the same people mm. over and over again uh, setting up astroturfing, history-backing, supposedly, outfits. And then uh, I, I, spent, I, I wrote an article uh, last year. In fact, it turned into two articles, because, because once you go down the rabbit hole of those organisations, you end up going through one door into the next, and you meet all the same people in each room. And their influence is out of all proportion to their number. The same people are now going after the National Trust. It's the same people each time. And they change the name, they set up a new outfit. It's, um, it's an old tactic of the Revolutionary Communist Party, and you'll be surprised to hear that some members of the former Revolutionary Communist Party pop up with alarming regularity within these groups. Uh, the Revolutionary Communist Party was a very small outfit, but it has morphed into this quite frightening in a way. Or spiked online. Spiked online. But, but, you know, there have been former members of the RCP in Downing Street. There are... Manira Mirza. Yeah, there are many former RC people knocking about using the same old tactics, and now they're using them for history. Um, that is... You have to spend time and effort to dig into all of that. If you start trying to explain it to a friend in your kitchen, their eyes will start to glaze over <laughs> yeah, no, and they'll start yeah. asking when dinner's coming. <laughs> yes, uh, indeed. Or a drink, or another <laughs> or drink. Both, yeah, or both, yeah. yeah. Um, so, th and that's the point. It's deliberately opaque and it's made deliberately difficult. And these people get invited on to talk shows, radio shows, TV, uh, because they ring up and say, oh, would you like a representative of blah de blah de blah history to come on and talk about statues? So, uh, anyway, I'll shut up now. <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, Hannah, we're running out of time, but I do want to just, just ask you a question about, as it were, how you, how you get rid of the, the debased currency and replace it with the good, because um, I've just finished reading Ian Kershaw's new book on the power of uh, personality in history with, with a series of pen portraits of people ranging from Hitler to Mussolini to um, uh, Thatcher and Tito and Gorbachev. And it's, it's, it's a wonderful book. And, you know, one of the things that I would say is that, um, you know, the, 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 this is a goal. It's the best of times, the worst of times. I mean, there are some amazing historical books for the, for the lay reader coming out every week. So one doesn't want to be pessimistic. But there are these countervailing forces. So how do you... What are the the levers we can pull to stop the, 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 the base currency from driving out the good? Yeah. Well, I think on a personal level, the first thing we can do is to give ourselves permission to feel nostalgia. Yeah. Um, you know, our emotions are valid. And, you know, I, I'm not suggesting that, you know, we replace nostalgia with a kind of snarky, you know, debunking kind of one-no attitude towards the past. Uh, you know, I'm certainly not kind of suggesting everyone go out and feel some guilt and shame instead. Um, no, they can if they want. Presumably. They can. I, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not telling not, anyone how to feel, but it's, it's, it, it's often know, kind yeah. of presented as yes. the two options are British history yes. was perfect or we feel self-hatred, which yes. is obviously just a ridiculous binary. Um, but I think the second thing to say is, like, of course, Andrew's right. We have a deep need for stories. We're storytelling beings. We want mythic, larger-than-life narratives. I enjoy them. <laughs> we need sometimes to be adults and recognise that that's not this, a straightforward reflection of reality. You know, I love Hilary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell novels. You know, I think we are perfectly capable as people of, you know, really enjoying these stories and then recognising that that's not the same as the past as it was lived at the time and it's not the same as history. Um, but I do probably think historians can get a bit better at making the case that, that changing your minds about the past is really exciting. I think that's a great, uh, that's an absolutely brilliant message. I've been told by uh, Liz and Mark that we have to end at 
826 <laughs> on the dot, and I'm understandably loath to annoy either of them. So um, it, it coming up to 826, um, sadly we have to stop, um, more than my job's worth. But could you join me in thanking um, Hannah and Andy for this very much? And